I'm very sorry for the technical problems. I'm very sorry, uh, uh, not at least, because I thought all questions that I cannot explain, I would address to the next speaker. But now the next speaker was already here. <laughs> Therefore, I stay alone on the stage. And uh, the burden on volume of cyanosis. As I get this question from the scientific committee, my first uh, thing was, uh, what, they, uh, what do they want from me? But after that, I thought, oh, I'm one of them. Therefore, I go to the library, and I was looking for a couple of old books uh, to try to understand this problem. At first, I found this sentence of Galen, who said, as you know, 2,000 years ago, then venous blood passed through the minute pores in the interventricular septum into the left ventricle. Then the Harvey, one and a half thousand years later, he said, by the hell there are no holes in the septum, nor can they be detected. Of course, in controversy to Galen, who tried to explain the circulation with this sentence, but there are no holes. And uh, one, uh, 150 years later, in the first book that we can address, uh, the book of congenital heart disease, the John Fair, uh, 1814, said on malformation of the human heart, I leave no doubt in my mind that the hole in the septum is to be referred to malformation. Therefore, uh, the holes that we are interested for are the malformations. And uh, in the second edition of this book, uh, 1866, the, um, the Peacock said, that the cardiac anomalies are therefore classed into those in which are the rest of development occurs at the more advanced period of fertile existence. Such are the cases with imperfect separation of the ventricles. And this perfect picture where you can recognize this uh, huge VSD under the level of the aortic valve. And he described a couple of cases. For example, the first one uh, that was treated in Brompton and uh, 18 years of age, he died on Ftidis and he had been cyanotic since he was two years of age. Or another one died of abscess in the right hemisphere of the brain and uh, complained a nausea and headache from the earliest period uh, of his life. Therefore, we know since many years, more than 200, the problems of these patients, they are described in all books that we read uh, during we learn physiological consequence of in all organs and systems neuronephral, hepatic, cardiac, lung, bone, and so on. Therefore, it was a little bit difficult for me, what should I talk about? And um, I was looking for old literature and found a publication from uh, 1853 from Birmingham. They collected all uh, patients with congenital heart disease, 1633, that were born from 1940 to 1949. And we can see that the diagnosis post-mortem and from the death register, also um, 100 years after the sentence of Peacock, it was still post-mortem. Therefore, we know that it is complex situation. And if we compare this with the Atlas of Mount Abo that was published 1936, then we still have the most uh, uh, majority of patients with cyanotic cyanosis and with um, volume overload. Therefore, it's really a burden, these two problems. Therefore, if you look in this publication that we find that only four of them survived to the 10th birthday, it's really a burden. And therefore, before we uh, look for the overload, I think we need a little bit to know about the load, because that we try to preserve is not the volume, but the shell of our organ. Uh, and he is exposed already because it was too much volume load. Therefore, also William Harvey said, uh, 1628, that the diastolic is not so important. Systolic is the mechanism of the contraction. But to get this contraction, we need a filling. We need a preload that is shown perfectly in this mathematical model of the heart from 2005. And uh, I was looking for this problem with load, and I found that already 1866 in Leipzig, there were the first experiments with load of the ventricle, and the influence of the diastolic feeling, that was a mechanism uh, to, to get the contraction. Therefore, they uh, get a heart from the frog and reduce the volume load, and then give it again, and we see the pressure because the contraction and coming back. And after that, later, Frank, in this publication, 1895, it was 30 um, years later, described the dynamic 
of the heart uh, or cardiac muscle, and he took also the frog heart. Therefore, I'm optimistic for our cyanotic hearts because the first experiments was, were done with the frog heart. And he put it into this um, machine with volume load and pressure measurement before and after the heart. And therefore, um, he understand the mechanism of this problem. And he write, from my experiments, it can be seen that tension rises as feeling increases. Therefore, perfect. A couple of years later, Starling described this a little bit detailed in, a dogs, in dogs. And he said that within physiological limits, we need a feel it, feeling within the physiological limits. Too much feeling can be a problem. And at the same time, this um, Soviet uh, scientist, Brukonenko, in 1926, um, performed his experiments. If you can start this uh, video, uh, this is the heart of the dog. The contraction are not coordinated to, an, to each other, um, atrium and ventricle. But if we give volume, we can see that we'll get perfectly coordinated contraction in the uh, torque between atrium and ventricle. Therefore, volume is very important. And if you're looking for the real name of this mechanism, then we can say Halles, Halle, Muller, Ludwig, Roy, and Adam, Howell, Donaldson, Frank, Starling relationship. Therefore, it's a long uh, historical uh, research, but already in the middle of the last century, it was known that we have such funny things there, actin, troponin, myosin, and something else, something is what is responsible for the contraction. And nowadays, 100 years later, the, this scientist writes that over oh, the century of the George and Frank Starling law has greatly advanced our knowledge of the fundamental basis of muscles. Therefore, the principle is the same, but very signaling points are in between, such as calcium and very other uh, really uh, important knowledge to the contraction of the heart muscle. I wouldn't go inside of this because I cannot understand it completely. We know we, we need a uh, physiologist to, to understand all these things, but we know our Frank Starling mechanism, and now we can explain what is the problem. With increase of the diastolic preload, we get on any steps of the contraction, optimal sacromere length, and after that, left ventricular dysfunction. If this, all these molecular mechanisms are normal uh, together. And then it explodes. And then we cannot preserve more our, the shell of, of, of our volume. But what is the potential for recovery in shunt-dependent, valve regurgitation-dependent, or volume overload dependent in univentricular heart? Do we have any explanation for this? It is not really possible to find this explanation in these detailed questions. But we have a couple of sentences in regard to remodeling. For example, in this study, it was evaluated the um, assay of troponin in children with congenital heart disease as a marker. And they said, we can see it here, that um, you have the uh, extremely um, in, in, increased left ventricular volume and right ventricular volume in VSD, increased right ventricular volume in uh, ASD. And they compared the ASD group, VSD group in normal population. And, but they found also that uh, NT uh, pro BNP was extremely elevated in the population with ventricular septum defect. And they said that they can observe such a myocardial injury that come much more early, uh, uh, probably much more early if we try to uh, treat these patients. And the troponin level was an interesting marker to uh, address these problems. Therefore, here, for example, we can see the correlation of the troponin level with the pressure load and uh, pressure relation between the pulmonary and systemic. And of course, in VSD patients, it was significantly, uh, 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 very significant. And in this uh, picture, we can see the correlation between uh, troponin level and pro -BNP level. Also in the patients with VSD, it, it was statistically very uh, significant. And in this uh, picture, you can see the correlation and the block plots uh, between healthy population, ASD and VSD in regard to the troponin. And not only, of course, clearly significant elevated level of troponin in VSD group, but also the ESD, pure volume overload, the troponin level before surgery was significantly high and compared to the normal population. The other publication performed 
the comparison between sham operation and induced aortic regurgitation in the rats. In eight um, rats, it was um, uh, aortic regurgitation um, uh, uh, um, performed. And of course, nine months later, we see all these hemodynamic uh, echocardiographic parameters, they are much more uh, high in the, uh, in, the, in the group with regurgitation. But this is clear. Also, the function, the contractility was not so good nine months later. This is also probably clear. But what they describe, that there was a significant metabolic stress and completely other energetic adaptation the patients with um, uh, aortic regurgitation, uh, therefore with acute volume overload. And uh, uh, they said that um, that severe metabolic abnormalities, even when systolic function seems preserved, are already there. What do they do? They will look for fatic exit oxygen, um, um, uh, energetic uh, mechanism for mitochondria, and they said that soon after the induction of the aortic regurgitation, this fatic exit oxygenation seems to be increased even before left femoral dilation has taken place. Then, 14 days later, the, it was the down regulation, that's my point, it was the down regulation in all these genes and in the oxygenation of fatic acid, acid. And then that was a kind of the compensate phase with dilation of the left ventricle. And nine months later, for all this echocardiographic data that we saw in the um, previous uh, dia, that was down regulation of all these signs of the mitochondrial um, uh, uh, life and the ventricular uh, diameter was extremely increased. And they say there were a couple of other genes that this is associated with mitochondrial function metabolism and it was down-regulated in aortic regurgitation rates. And myocardial energy substrate preferences affected early in the evaluation of the left angular volume overload cardiomyopathy. The other publication they found, it was 20 pigs and it was one group of the sham operated controls and three groups, also uh, five uh, pigs. They, they get aorta caval shunt for respectively 24, 48, and 96 hours. And after that, there was a histological status. And they observed that you can see here the cardiac output increased enormous, of course, in the group of the uh, aorta caval shunts. But if you see in the last line, the mass of the left ventricle increased also 96 hours after these uh, aortic, uh, after the um, aortic caval shunt. And here you can see it. And they describe on the histological samples, then you can see it in the, uh, the, the E, is the normal, the, they are controls. And they describe that early in transit oxidative stress, which occurs within hours after heart muscle is subjected to volume overload, may mediate amplitude dependent apoptotic and hypertrophic response because of the activation of the apoptotic related protein kinase. And there you can see it also the normals without apoptosis and 84, uh, 48 hours after the um, uh, uh, aortic avalchan, this apoptosis is it induced in the, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, patients with, in the peaks with, uh, with aortic avalchans. And on the fourth day, it was already to find the hypertrophic signs in the peaks with aortic avalchan. Therefore, acute answer with apoptosis and hypertrophy of the myocytes in the in the, in the peaks where, where, where severe volume overload was addressed. Therefore, the question is, who is blame? Cardioplegia, we can do something for this, or we cannot avoid it, volume offload, we need it, we want, we go for this, or probably preoperative metabolic stress that we can found also before the operation. Can we go a little bit um, early for treatment and probably pro um, preserve the ventricular function? And then a couple of uh, findings that I uh, get from uh, in regard to the burden of cyanosis. The neuro problem of the cyanosis. Here the publication where 40 term newborns with congenital heart disease, TGA and hypoplastic left heart was analyzed with MRI. 
and they found that it was with a speed brain abnormalities similar to those in premature newborns. And uh, if you can see these um, yellow um, uh, samples, then slightly red is uh, lactate, and green is choline. And the lactate, as I asked for neuroradiologists, they said this is the signs also of apoptosis in this part of the brain. And 30% of the patients were found to have this white matter injury from the patients that were um, uh, investigated. In the other study, they were looking for such a kind of total maturation score. Therefore, the signs in the brain uh, finding with um, MRI, the signs of the, of the, of the um, mature um, in the newborns. For example, the myelinization, the migration of the glial cells, and so on. And we can see from this diagram that patients with congenital heart disease underlie not only the normal term newborns, but also slightly preterm newborns. And they, had, they said that the term infants with neoplastic left heart and TGA have brains that are smaller and structurally less mature than expected. Therefore, Probably they need a little bit more time during the pregnancy, but anyway, we shouldn't get it too early for our therapy. And also in adults, they measured the global um, brain volume and uh, the thickness um, of, the, of the, and the cortical thickness, and they found in this uh, fire, fire in the <laughs> brain, I would say, that there are many focus with reduced cortical thickness and extensive generalized white matter and gray matter volumetric loss and increase of cerebrospinal fluid volume. Therefore, we have significant, significant problems during the whole life, but we can hope in this multi-center study and some of the authors are in the auditorium, for example, that the patients before Fontan procedure um, has good cognitive composite score, language and motor composite score, 100 is about uh, 50%. And therefore, we are slightly optimistic that we um, that we that we um, good in timing with these patients. But nevertheless, if we take this paper, 800 publications summarized, 55 of them met the criteria for inclusion, and they were looking for the problem of hypoxia or cognition in, in childhood. 80% reported adverse events, events effects and. From control studies, also about 80% reported adverse effects. And mostly it was patients with congenital heart disease and sleep disorder breathing, but congenital heart disease are within the population. Therefore, adverse impact of chronic intimate hypoxia on development, behavior, and academic achievement was found. What is with the kidney? This is a publication from 1966 from Speer, and they said that this picture from electron microscopy is similar to the liberal glomerulonephritis or diffuse diabetic glomerulosclerosis. And he said that abnormalities of renal function and glomerular and renal vascular structure occurs in some patients with cyanotic congenital heart disease because of significance and outcome which remain to be determined. What do we have 40 years later? The pictures for me are similar, approximately the same, but this is enlarged glomerular and cyanotic patient with dilation of the afferent arteriola and dilation extension to the glomerulus. You can see it there. And then increase is in euxlegmental accelerated mesangial matrix and thickening of the Bauman capsule. You can find it here. What does it mean? They were looking also for the principle of this problem and they found two pathogenetic mechanisms, vascular and non-vascular. And in the vascular mechanism, we have erythrocytosis. We are back again to the problem of the cyanosis with increased viscosity, endothelial shear stress, intergomerular and O release, and dilated vascular bed. And in non-vascular, the megakaryocytes, the cytoplasm, which include many cytokines and other uh, agents, they get during right to left shunt to the kidney and release their cytokines there. And there you can see a huge a uh, megakaryocyte where platelets, granulas, and uh, red blood cells are within. Therefore, there are a couple of mechanisms that can explain these problems. And in this publication that said 
that the problem is grows by the times go on, goes on. The age of the patients seems to play a role in their development. This is a kidney of 125 years patients with tetralogy of fallow. With all problems that we uh, already talked about, but also macroscopic, it is not difficult to recognize. And uh, at least the bone, what are there, this is very old publication, and the second metacarpal bone was compared between 15 years acyanotic patients with VSD, 100 to 20 patients was in generally, 15 years cyanotic with troncos, and 18 years cyanotic with TGA in pulmonary stenosis. And they found that cortical thickness was normal, normal in VSD, below sixth percentile in B, and below second percentile in C. And the bone age was normal in A and B, and retired three years in patients with significant cyanosis. And they say that it is extremely important and they can, can explain the retardation of the bone growth in this patient. Here they compared in 110 patients the bone age and chronological age in cyanotic and acyanotic patient. And here you can see 18 months of age, the cyanotic patients with bone age of two months and the non-cyanotic patients with bone age of normal 18 to 24. And the other one sample, two years old patients with two years old born in non-cyanotic and extremely retarded born age in the cyanotic. Therefore, they said that hypoxemia appears to be a significant factor in born age, especially in the extremely low saturation. We know this problem with scoliosis, and this is mostly in cyanotic patients, about 6% was described, and 8% 8, 8 after the operation developed the cyanotis over by the time goes on. Only a couple of words to the liver. Hypoxemia can induce these transcription factors, and that can activate several disease also in the liver. I skip it uh, at least because we all know the problem of um, Fontana-associated liver disease. It is the low output and uh, venous return stagnation. And, but we should not think about this is red one, hepatic artery is not so red in the real life because we have also continuous cyanosis in this patient. Therefore, we have many problems that induce this fibrosis of the liver. And then we have portal liver fibrosis, dilation of the liver cyanosis and sinusitis liver fibrosis. And it's a specific um, illness according to the Fontan problems. And this is a picture that we get of our patients with heterogeneous parenchymal epitexture, liver vein dilation, segmental arterial hypertrophy, and hyperopigenic lesions. And if we go for the macroscopic, then we have here significantly um, abnormal parenchym of the liver up to um, uh, carcinoma developed. And in the patients with cyanosis, the volume overload is much more complex and they have probably, they, 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 they cannot maintain over the long time this situation, but uh, the small, um, small um, uh, sun, a little bit sun in our problem, they have also the uh, adaptation response to chronic hypoxia that can probably be helpful uh, for this patient. And uh, exposure to moderate chronic hypoxia may reduce cardioprotective properties. And, here again, these hypoxia-inducible protein factors that, uh, that are extremely important to the switch in the metabolic of the mitochondria from fatty acid metabolisms to carbohydrate and efficiency of the energy utilization and cardioprotection. But it is a very delicate balance, and we have physiological hypoxia, and we have unphysiological or pathophysiological hypoxia. And nobody can say ex uh, exactly where the board of this uh, of this, of this balance, because if we leave this balance from pathological, physiological to pathophysiological hypoxia, then we get cardiac damage and our house fall down. I have no conclusions. I have just a question to the auditorium. Why are our patients so complex? Thank you very much.